Listeners, welcome to the Business Method Podcast, or welcome back to the Business Method Podcast. I'm really excited about our guest today um, for a couple of reasons. One, we have Tim Gannon on the show, who is the founder of Outback Steakhouse and uh, many other restaurants, and his son, Chris Gannon, who's probably about similar age as me and um, is a successful entrepreneur, the co-founder with his father of Bolay Restaurants, which is Florida's hottest new restaurant concept for the fast and casual dining scene. And uh, we're going to ch- chat with both of them. I'm uh, excited about this interview for a couple of reasons. I grew up with Outback, and so I've been there many times in my youth, um, just not even not even a few minutes away from our house where I grew up. There's an Outback Steakhouse. and uh, But also, I love the dynamic between the father and son legacy of entrepreneurship. Um you know, they, they, people say quite often, you know, don't, don't get in business with your family. Don't get in business with your family. It's going to lead to bad things. And I always thought that was, I don't know. I just thought it was bad advice I, because I love, like, I always, as an entrepreneur, I want to have kids and I want to have kids involved in the business and I want to have uh, a wife involved in the business. And so the fact that you guys do this like the way that you've done, I think is absolutely fascinating. So we're going to talk about that. But Chris and, and Tim, how are you guys doing? Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm doing great. And uh, just one little clarification. Um, uh-huh. I'm, I, I was, instead of, I would love to have been the founder, but I'm the co-founder of Outback. I have two wonderful okay. partners, uh, Chris Sullivan and Bob Basham, uh, wonderful partners and an interesting One little interesting story about that is in 1994, Chris was, we were nominated to be Entrepreneur of the Year from Inc. Magazine. Uh And um, I'm glad my son, Chris, won won it from Ernst & Young this last year for the state of Florida. But um, when they presented it to Chris Sullivan, he said, you have to give it the award to all three of us. And Inc. Magazine said, no, it's a singular entrepreneur. It's not Entrepreneurs of the Year. So um, he, we are the first people that um, that they gave it to all three of us. Uh, you know, they made a big exception for us, and and that that really goes to speak to the essence of our you know our business philosophy today about partnership. Yeah, it's a, it's a team it's a team driven uh, enterprise, right? To build a successful business, quite often, and so. Um, yeah, that's awesome. That's amazing. But you, you, so you guys started out back, I don't know, how many years ago was it? Um, we started in 88. So, okay. Literally like 30, um, 32 years ago. Okay. Uh, is when we started it in, in Tampa, Florida. I was just in Tampa at the original Outback, the one that had my name over the window as the proprietor and the actual store I, I ran as a managing partner. Yeah, um, you know, the first one. And, uh, you know, it was a very, you know, interesting to go back, reel back in your history, go back to the original store and brings all the stories back of the struggle of when we had very low sales and hoping, you know, to get to break even and, and then how we excitedly got a good write up and we went into a, a wait with people waiting outside and, and then how the whole outback started to grow uh, pr- very organically, very quickly. Yeah. Where did the idea originally come from, Tim? Yeah. Um, Chris Sullivan um, was my general manager when I was a trainee at Steak and Ale, 1974. Okay. <laughs> so it goes way, way back to the Steak and Ale days. And when I was a trainee, we started a friendship there. And we followed that friendship all the way through our Steak and Ale days. You know, I was transferred to New Orleans and it's in New Orleans where I learned all about spices and food and flavors. And, and that's where I created the first concept of the Bloomin' Onion. And Chris used to come and visit, came to visit me in New Orleans um, during the final four basketball tournament one year. And he said, I love the work that you do. I love the food that you produce. Would you uh, consider starting a partnership with my my uh, other partner, Bob Basham, would you consider joining us to start a new concept? And, you know, new concepts, you know, I had done a couple of them before mm-hmm. and they're scary. I mean, you know, 
you, it's like opening, you know, a play on Broadway. You really don't know what you have until <laughs> people, you know, line up in line for you. And then you, then, you know, but yeah. it, it's all guesswork and it's all like, you know, hope and prayers and, you know, um, you know, so, so that was, you know, it's, 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 it's actually scary. Um, and especially cause they flop, it's, a, there's a lot to go to do to clean up a flop, you know, <laughs> right. when something doesn't work and you have a, you have a lease on a property, you know, that you have to figure out what you're going to do. It's, it's, it's a painful exit. It's not clean. So, uh, so all that was really through my mind, but on the other side, I always wanted to become a polo player. And I said this, if I'm going to get to the polo field, it's going to be with Chris Sullivan and Bob and, and doing uh, a concept where I have equity in the concept. And um, that's what they gave me was a, an equity just for my food knowledge. So that was okay. a you know, really nice thing to do, an important thing to do, um, you know, for me. So, we, you know, I had uh, uh, so that really helped. And we went public in 1992. And then I started playing polo, you know, as soon as we went public and I had some cash. So why is that why you waited until 92 to play polo? Because you needed yes. some cash. That yeah, have... polo is a really expensive sport. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I had a, you know, a great story. I had a saddle that was given to me when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And it was given to me by, by my best friend's father. And he said, keep the saddle. You become a great polo player with the saddle. So I always hung on to the saddle. And then when I started to go to Outback, I was still flat broke. And I had to, I sold the saddle for gas money to get to Tampa. Mm -hmm. I arrived in Tampa with $37 and I had to live with one of my partners at his house for about six weeks, you know, until I could get enough cash. Because we're all, you know, we're struggling. We're all struggling. Nobody yeah. had really huge deep pockets. They were doing much better than I did. But we had to borrow money for our first one. And it, I think 300000 was the number that it cost our first one to renovate uh, a restaurant that had been uh, closed two other times. So we put our money into it and borrowed some money from our, you know, our uncle, fathers, brothers, whatever. Who we could, <laughs> and a lot of people turned us down. Yeah. You know, there were some local doctors and, you know, and doctors are always famous for making bad investments. And they turned down one of the great investments, you know. Uh, <laughs> they regret so, that now, anyway, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so I sold the saddle. We, we bought the saddle back about a year later. And then when we went public, then I could start playing polo. And in 92, I started. And by 90, by um, within 10 years, uh, within really eight years, we had won five U.S. Opens. Wow. And Chris was on one of the winning teams when he was... 17 years old did you guys uh, play on the same team uh we, we 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 did um and we our proud my proudest tournament was in argentina we played the masters cup together in a stadium you know that holds about thirty-seven thousand people and chris and i played together and won the masters cup oh, but how for cool. the u.s open he won it with three other professionals and my other times that i won it was with a different team so he was he was on the team, but we never played the U.S. Open together. Normally, yeah. two sponsors or two amateurs don't play on the same team. Oh, that's amazing! Um, so you guys are both world champion polo players, and and I just like to ask because this is this is a uh, an important part of your guys' story. Maybe you can talk about the importance of polo and the lifestyle of a polo player and how that. Um, overlaps into one the family, but also the the entrepreneur industry that you guys are a part of. Sure, I think you know the essence of polo is that it's the oldest team sport in the world. It's okay. two thousand years old. Oh wow! It's, only, it's a, one of the original team sports that was created, and you use the reason I won is not that I'm a great polo player. And I'm not relative to the people that were on my team, but I knew how to pick a team that could complement each other. And each person on the team had to fulfill a different role. Mm -hmm. Some were aggressive and risk takers, other were quarterbacks. And then another team member was defense, all only defense. So each person had the, so you had a different personality. They had a different role to play. 
And if they did that role correctly, you complement, and they were different, you know, um, each, the different sets of talents. And so that's what you have to do is to find, you, you know, your weak area and then surround yourself with people that have strengths in your weak area. Mm -hmm. So that's how you build your team. And, 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 you know, and that's what works with Chris is that he knows now through Polo how to build a team and I'll back, you know, Bob, Chris and myself, we were all different guys. I mean, you know, I was totally different than Bob, Bob, very conservative. He's an operator. Chris is imaginative and, and he's very astute in finance, mm -hmm. you know, and what, what the next moves are to go public, whatever. And I was purely food, uh, spices and flavors and aroma, all of that. So I think we all may, added something quite different. We were all very different guys. And I think um, Chris learned all that. He watched, you know, Chris was by my side throughout all the outback, the openings. And, you know, he would, you know, be stuck in some of the restaurants when I'd have to go in and take, you'd have to take a nap on one of the benches. I'll, you know, it was, I was a single father and, and you know, kind of dragging my son to visit, I had no choice, you know, uh -huh. uh, we'd go stay at Holiday Inns during openings and trying to figure out how you can have fun at Holiday Inn. Um, and we figured all that out. So, um, but, but, you know, it was, um, uh, so Chris kind of came up in the restaurant business as, you know, through his teenage years and watched me give the speeches and, and all that. And now when I look at Chris and I see he does a far better job uh, uh, on his, um, on, on inspiring people. He has a natural charisma, you know, that's evident. Uh, he's, uh, he's a good listener. And I think that's the, the number one quality of a great leader is to mm -hmm. be a listener. Um, and, um, and I think that's very important. And he's the other thing, one of his qualities is that he's humble. Um, he will never, you know, tell you, he won the Open. He'll never tell you he was Chief Osceola at Florida State, mm -hmm. you know, going up on a horse with a spear in front of 80,000 people, you know, oh, with wow. no saddle. <laughs> it's an incredible feat, but he never says that. And I always tell him, Chris, you should tell people you're Chief Osceola. You know, I, you know, there's Florida State fans. Well, there's some University of Florida fans, so you do have to be careful. But um, I, I think, you know... Uh, I think those leadership qualities Chris has are far better than mine. You know, I have a big voice and uh, feel strong and passionate about what I what I believe in. And Chris has all of that. But I think humility and listening are such important skills, so mm -hmm. important in today's world. You know, to be empathetic with your employees, the plight of the plight of the employee, you know, what mm -hmm. they struggle through, all of our people at these, you know, not great wages, but in, in the challenges of how to make those wages, make a life. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very excited about watching Chris develop this great concept play. And I know it's going to be, it, it, it's going to be big. And, you know, I think bigger than Outback. You know, now oh, wow. we became a four billion dollar company. Yeah, I truly believe that. I believe that. You know, it's, it's got a menu that's not based on steak. Um, the the investment level is lower. Uh -huh. uh, I think that it has a broad appeal, um, and it's uh, you know the the financials make more sense uh, because the investment is lower and the sales are comparable to a lot of outbacks. You know. Yeah. So I, you know, on half on half the size. So for me, I think it's got a, a great formula for success. But Chris, that's you know, uh, Chris, why don't you why don't you tell you know how Bole started and how and how you know how that sort of came about? I think that's a fascinating story. I, I want to get to that real quick, Chris. Um, but first, before we do, um, I'd like to ask you. Your dad was complimenting you on your your. Um, quality of humility. And this is something that I respect a lot and study a lot to, to be humble is such a powerful thing. So where do you think that came for you? Where did you get those traits? Is this something that you were naturally born with? Um, I know one thing that kind of 
makes me humble is I'm like always working on another project and I'm so focused on the next project that I just don't talk about my past quite often. And I'm just like building, building, building and, and, and always going towards whatever that next mountain to climb is that I don't think about my past. So I'm curious if it's similar to you um, or what do you think it is for you? Yeah, I would, Chris, I would say, I, you know, hundred percent. I, I'm not a great storyteller. Um, I've realized that I wish I could be better. I'm always that guy that, you know, around the, the fire, I'm not the great to retell. I have such incredible stories where my dad can tell you about the, the chocolate, the way it tasted, or, uh, you know, the stars and the color and the, the, everything about that moment and bring you to that moment. Like he's creating a book. And, and I would say that too, it's to a flaw. I'm, I'm constantly focused on the next thing, you know, mm -hmm. or very objective. Okay. If I, even if I'm flying it, okay, I gotta get to the airport this time. I've just, I need to slow down sometimes and just be in the moment and, and good, bad, or ugly. I mean, it's like, I remember, you know, reading Michael Jordan's book, you know, as soon as he won the game, he allowed himself 24 hours to, to, to be happy. And then that was it. Boom. Next game. Or he <laughs> was even talking the about the thing. next game while he was in the locker room of the game he was just in. And I think that's kind of what I am. And, uh, and, you know, I'm not Michael Jordan by any means, but I, I admire that, that focus on, you know, build, build, build the next thing. Um, you know, but you, you got to make sure you don't let life pass you by either and enjoy the current moment and live in the stories. Um, but yeah. And, and the other thing I've just, you know, a lot of people think that we were brought up in the silver spoon where there was a moment where dad did very well in life and we got to go do really wonderful things. But there was also a big chapter early on in our, our my, my life where we didn't have much, you know, grew up in New Orleans, very, very poor, never, you know, really missed a meal per se. But other than that, you know, public schools, New Orleans system and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, it, it's wonderful to have that because I remember that. I remember coming home at night and macaroni and cheese was our only thing to eat for dinner. Um, and, uh, and you don't let go of that. So you don't, I guess, never want to go back to that either. So um, yeah. I guess, you know, keep working harder. That's a motivating drive. What, for you, what was the importance of polo as a young man, as a young boy growing up? Like, what did you see uh, in the, the arenas when your father was playing and practicing and why did it become important to you? I, I think for me, what I saw was just the dedication. Dad was always so good at building teams. And, you, you know, obviously you win by putting the best people on the field to go talk. We talk about that. It's win. It's in one of our core values now. And, and my dad was so great at putting these wonderful teams together. Memo Gracita was the best, you know, 16 U.S. Open champions. Adolfo Cambiaso, the next greatest, you know, he's the Tiger Woods of polo. And when you're around that, excellence it's like being around Hort schultz or um you know or, or jeff bezos any of these guys that are the, the the top of their game and that's what i was around and yes it was in polo but it was the same thing you're, you're winning whether you're winning in the business arena or you're winning on a athletic field you're still competing against other people um and and building a team because everything i think business is a team sport um through and through and, uh, and so when you build a great team, you can go win. Um, and, and you also have to, you know, really find out who's good or who's bad to complement a team, you know, fill in your weaknesses with other people's strengths and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I, I would imagine, I know nothing about polo guys other than you guys, you play it on a horse. Right. Um, and I would think it'd be a fascinating network of people to be a part of. Could you guys talk about you know, maybe what there was some connections you made through polo or some of the people that you met through polo, um, that, that helped career, you know, either launch, you know, your career, or expand your careers, um, or business or, you know, just the people you meet in that environment. I can take that one real quick and I'll let dad elaborate mm -hmm. for me. Winston Churchill said it best. If you have a handicap in polo, which is your rating, like a golf handicap, you have a passport to the world. And he meant that because you're on the field with, um, I look at my dad who's played against the Sultan of Brunei. We both played against Prince William, Harry and, um, and Charles and, and, you know, just the Rod Mahari of Dalit dad tell you all the people he's played against the world. But, you know, for me, 
you don't do business on the polo field. I thought that as a young polo player, I'm going to be around all these CEOs and they're going to give me a job. No, you learn real quickly that they don't give you a job because they realize you're not a business person at that moment. Right. Um, it was, it was a hard lesson. I have a lot of young polo players coming to me and I'm like, Hey guys, you gotta, yeah, yeah I want to come work in a restaurant. I'll give you that intro, but you're not going to just get to be CEO. And I learned right. that lesson. But the one thing that I took from it was it was the motivation. I remember going to the polo field and it was exciting to go play polo, but as soon as the game was over, you're like, okay, now what? You know, it was just for this fun versus these other, the sponsors that were coming to the polo field, they were coming in their suit, quickly changing out their suit to put their polo jersey on. They were talking about the deal they just landed or the investment they're going to make or the negotiation they just went through. And that excitement um, spearheaded me. I actually quit polo and went back to school to finish out my degree because I was so inspired by these business guys um, and, and what they were doing versus, you know, for me, just playing polo all day. Yeah. How about you, Tim? Um, I'm sitting in this room here, and uh, I'll show you one photo that is, I think, it's a smile that I hope I can remember how to do the rest of my life. But um, that, uh, this is me um, after a championship. That's uh -huh. Tommy Lee Jones on my right. Uh -huh. uh, and we're laughing about a great moment on the field uh, where he knocked me off my horse and I was dragged on the stirrups all the way down the field. Uh -huh. And we we're just laughing about the great moment of that. But I, I've met a lot of interesting, and I think Chris says it right. I said, you know, I think you got to go be successful and then go play polo. You can't go to try and be a polo player and, and hope to find success in that world. Yeah. You've got to find success first and then you celebrate that success in the polo world, you you never. I don't ever remember talking, you know, you know, history of films or what film Tommy's work on. No one likes to do that. Polo was an escape for everybody to get away from business. You know, to go on that polo field and forget about. You know, we played with the Budweiser, the Bush brothers from Budweiser. They mm -hmm. don't ever want to talk about, you know, the Budweiser sales or or any of that or you know, um, all the different interesting people that play. Uh, and that's what makes the camar camaraderie, um, the, you know, the spirit of partnership so strong in polo because you're, everyone's the same. We're all polo players. We're not, you know, we're not actors or, you know, beer makers or steak, steak guys. We're all polo players. We're on the same level. Even, I mean, <laughs> it's strange to think of that, but, you're on the same level with Prince Charles, who's the future king of England, but or the Maharaji of Jaipur. But in a sense, you are. In a sense, you can talk about your horses and how the game went and how the struggle for polo and riding is the same for me as it is for Prince William. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it's an equalizer. And I think, but I think Chris is right. I said, you know, you, you don't go, you don't go to the polo field you know, and, and, and hope to get a great job. Um, you know, you, you go get the degree, you know, and the important structure of your life that Chris went and did, you know, at Florida State and uh, got to respect as Chief Osceola. And then you emerge from that and come back, you know, into the polo world, um, you know. So I think it's a very important point um, that, you know, Polo is about celebrating, you know, your life's victories that you've already done, um, you know, and people who get into polo and don't have that success, they get into trouble because they're, they're always trying to play polo when they should be trying to build their career. <laughs> and, you know, you got to figure that out. So I'm glad, you know, Chris took a break from polo, went back to Florida State, got his degree. This is after it already won the U.S. Open and had the taste and the adrenaline of polo, that, that excitement. And it's hard to walk away from that, you know? And then he did though, and, and then came back and then got stayed in the, in the business world because he knew that was, that's, that's what's going to, you know, the, and he was working 70, 80 hours a week, like I did, you know, when he first came and worked at PDQ with me. And then he came and said, you know, let's, let's do a restaurant on our own dad. And, I was, I said, I'm all in on that. I said, that's what I love doing. I said, Chris 
though you we never know how how it's going to work but let's give it a try mm-hmm. and and i think the joy of having a family business and i i, I adore uh i i don't like i adore working uh with chris and and enjoy it and enjoy watching him succeed and that's the trickiest part of a guy like me that's had success is how to transfer success to your son mm-hmm. and and it's and it has to be something he earns himself you can't give it to him he's got to want it and and chris chris thank god has got um desire um and 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 you know he, he even though he came from you know most of his upbringing was in a pretty affluent lifestyle you know going on nassau and yachts and and argentina and playing with me and doing all that and he had to walk away from all of that mm-hmm. and then get humble, go to work, get into the, into the restaurants and do the hard work of figuring that out. And then to create something, to create a whole new restaurant company, uh, you know, with him and a group of teams, you know, I will tell you, it's Bole was 75% Chris from the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, I helped and st- steered the food a little bit, but it was him that put the manuals together, the, the staff together, hire the employees, train the employees, figured out the systems for a, whole, a concept I had never worked on before it was this fast casual concept. It's a whole new genre of restaurants. Chris, there's a, there's a lot of people that come from uh, wealthy families and don't have the drive to, to build something, you know, they'll, They'll, they'll have money and they'll be okay with the money that they have and they just, you know, live their life as it is. And it sounds like um, you did have a bit of your life when you were younger um, as a poor guy, as a poor young man, poor boy, uh, in a poor family, but then that shifted. Uh, was that, is that the drive that keeps you going nowadays and, and wanting to build more or build more? Or do you think it's inherited in you that you got from your dad? Or what do you think that is that, that makes you want to, to build and to earn your own success? I think it's, it's a great question. It's very fat, uh, multifaceted. You know, I look back at my youth and early stage, you didn't know you're poor because you were just happy. We had love. Yeah. We had a great mom, a great dad. And, uh, you know, you don't know, okay. I didn't get the name brand roller skates, but I got roller skates and, uh, you know, you just don't really realize it. And now, you know, obviously to be successful is important, but there's many times, not many, but where I'm not even sure how much money we're making. Um, it's the drive to win. And I prom- and I think that's really, it is to go find that next great site or mm-hmm. go find that next great leader of one of our restaurants or that next, I mean, I was out the other day driving around looking for hourly team members. Cause that's just, I got a rush. I don't know. It's just fun, you know, going after people and building that team. Um, and they say, you know, you get to a certain X amount of dollars a month where none of it makes matters anymore. Cause it really doesn't influence your life either way. Uh, definitely not there yet or still in the grind, mm-hmm. but, um, but that just desire to win. And, and, and I think now, too, um, Bole is kind of just overnight grown into this organization. We have almost a thousand people working with us. And um, and I say with I never say for um, they work with us as a team, um, you know, the responsibility to provide something perfect for them. It's far outweighs me anymore. Now it's really what can I do to provide for them? And when you take care of them, you know, we get taken care of. So first and foremost is how do we become the best? a uh, place for our team to work and thrive and grow and, and find success out there. Um, but I think, you know, in business again, you know, that's why we're adding it to our, one of our core values. And I think some people are okay with second place, um, mm-hmm. you know, but, but first place is first place is who you remember. You don't remember who came in second, the Daytona 500 <laughs> last year or the second in, in the NFL, you remember who won. And, um, I think that's something that's deep inside of our, uh, our DNA is just the desire to win. So Tim, you took out back and you grew, you guys took out back, you grew it to 1400 locations. Um, you then created, I guess you could call umbrella restaurants underneath that with Carabas and bonefish and Roy's restaurant and Fleming's prime steakhouse. Um, so, and then just created an amazing billion dollar corporation there went public. And so Chris, I would, I would, I want to ask you, 
what is what is first place for you? What is winning? Do you want to go public with Bolays and create an umbrella of companies underneath uh, uh, the Bolay empire? That is the, the the magic question, I guess, if you will. And um, you know, I'm, I really study you know my dad and how much fun he had and the, and the success they had when they went public. And I also remember he told me one time when he went public, you're now it's a different game. You know, you have quarterly earnings calls, you can't mess up, you're scrutinized, you're this and that, you know, we own the company 100%. And when you own a company 100%, you know, is that more important than money? I don't know yet. I think it's a little too early in the game to decide that. Um, we're, we're, you know, one of my best friends also who <laughs> ironically just went public with his company this year and is a great mentor of mine. He always said, Chris, do not build a company to, to go public build a great company and then one day you will decide if you go public or not. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm just, you know, everybody asks me, what are you taking? And I'm just saying, taking that, you know, that, that whole thought out of the mind, because the moment you just start thinking about the company public is the moment you just start running the company from numbers perspective. And mm -hmm. I've seen it, it can happen so quickly versus staying true to the quality of the food, the quality of your team, making right business decisions. I mean, cause you, you go too fast, you start making two things really poorly, I think is real estate decisions and people decisions. And those are the two most important things that yeah. we need to do right now because the, the menu and the food and all that and the systems and process, that's all evolving and we're going to constantly tweak that. But it's now how do we go build a great team and how do we uh, go find that next great location? Um, and, and so if you're, if you're thinking about going public, do you take your eye off that ball? Maybe. And so um, you know, and, and we're, you know, we're having a lot of fun. I mean, we're really truly having fun at what we're doing right now. And, uh, and, you know, I got two young kids and trying to also balance that being there for them. Cause I know that, you know, they're, you know, five and two and, you know, in 10 years, they're gone when they're mm -hmm. 15, 16 year olds, they're, they're, you know, your, your kid's still there, but you have this magic window as any, any parent would know, um, to really be there and, and make a, an impact. And, um, so I have all these different things that are pulling and, you know, just got to decide that, um, that perfect balance, but, uh, yeah, having a lot of just, we're just having a blast doing what we're doing. And that's the cool part. Not, nice. it's not getting, you know, even navigating last year I and mean, even last year, there was some dark, dark moments, but look back and, you know, kind of gave us our, uh, a stronger suit of armor, if you will. Yeah. I was an early entrepreneur in the 08 recession um, in Phoenix, Arizona and, and in the real estate business too. And we got smashed, but I, I learned some of the best financial uh, lessons of my life, financial and life lessons, you know, and, and this whole business thing is just, uh, um, you know, it's just a little, it's important, but it's a little game compared to the important things of life. Right. And, uh, going through a recession and surviving you, you really learn that. Um, Tim, in the early days, did you guys have those same goals as, as Chris did? Did you, did you eventually want you know, to go public or was yeah, it just, you know, for, for us, it was a different time. Uh -huh. It was right after 1987. And if you can remember back then, that was the Michael Milken junk bond days when the, you know, there was so much money going around and overnight it dried up uh -huh. overnight um, where the banking sort of collapsed and loans were, the money was impossible to get a hold of. We sold 20% of our company for $1.8 million uh -huh. back in the early days, just to get a hold of money. Mm -hmm. um, so it's much different than today. I mean, there's options of, you know, family offices coming in and, and supporting you and, and being a great uncle instead of a father, uh, you know, kind of figure to you. Um, uh, going public, you know, once you go public, you, you lose so much control of your company. You know, it's very hard to maintain that control. I mean, uh, the Outback founders right now have very little to do uh, with the running of the Outback business. And, you know, it's gone through, gone public, gone private, gone public again. You know, it's, it's gone public three times. Mm -hmm. So I know all about it. And I think anybody that starts a company and loves their company, like we loved Outback, it was magical. You know, Outback was, had lines, two-hour lines for people to get in 
you know, to, to get into the restaurant at, for a long period of time. And people still love when you say I, the founder of Outback had created the Bloom and the Onion, they still like, oh my God. And they all have all kinds of stories of how they worked there through college and they celebrated their birthdays there. And it was a really part of a lot of people's lives. And so I think, you know, talking to Norman Breaker, who started Steak and Ale, he wished he had never sold Steak and Ale or never, you know, and he sold it to Pillsbury. And, you know, they took it over and they made it whatever they wanted to. And so it lost that founder's touch. Um, and so that's the risk of going public is that you've got to be willing to know that you're letting go of the reins to other people that are going to be a board. There's going to be a board um, uh, of trustees on that. They're going to help you make decisions. And if you lose the governing board shares or uh, percentage, then they can overrule you and change things, um, you know, the, for financial or for whatever reasons. And so I'm begging Chris, I said, you know, I think people's dreams in life are to be your own master, mm -hmm. you know, the master of your own fate. And I think we all, you talk to anybody who has run a public company and says, what would you like to do? I'd like to start my own little company and just wake up in the morning and know that this is my company and not have to report to anybody. I, you know, and I, you know, if Chris only knew what a golden chair he sits in uh, today and that it can only go down if you, you know, kind of bring in the wrong investor or you go public, you know, and you give up control. Now, there are other reasons that could be like if you really think this brand needs to be international in a multi billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. um, you may be, that may be a good option because the amount of liquidity that can come your way is incredible. You know, the cash, you know, but you, you're changing the nature. You're going to have to perform by quarter by quarter, every quarter you're under scrutiny. So it's, it's a really tough situation. It's a tough decision because it's tempting. It's like here, take a bite of the apple and see, <laughs> see, see, see what paradise is like. Well, I've been there and paradise is when you're your own company and you're running it the way you see fit and you're in charge and you can walk in and say, I started this. I can go into an outback and say, I started it. I'm the co-founder, but you know, uh, but you can't walk in the office and never influence the, the, the corporate office anymore. I mean, they're just, you know, they're running it and, that's the, the, you know, that's their responsibility as a CEO and stuff. So it's hard to maintain, you know, the founders, they try, but it's hard, it's hard to do that. And that's true for all companies that have ex founders and, you know, they go public and other people come in and run it, mm -hmm. you know, unless, unless there's a lot of control, like, you know, um, uh, people that are 80 years old and, uh, still running their companies and, and there are a lot of people out there that do that, you know, that are, are still, you know, like Chick-fil-A, you know, his, he ran that company with an iron fist, you know, yeah. through with Kathy, you know, and, and, you know, he did a fab fabulous job. And now it's, you know, it's run, you know, by a group of people that he kind of put in charge and nurtured and have a great culture. It's a, pri it's a great private company. Great. Yeah. So I, you know, it's a tough thing. I, I think I had fun being a public company. I, you know, ringing the bell, you know, at Wall Street mm -hmm. on New York Stock Exchange. Nothing, nothing sweeter than that. And we rang it. I rang it three times. We did a Nasdaq twice, and on New York. You know, those are huge moments yeah. uh, for a businessman is to go in front of the entire Wall Street and say, "Here you go. You're going to love us." So, um, you know. Um, but I, I, you know, it'll be a sad day when I hear Bolay's going public. It'll be sad and worrisome, uh, uh, you know, uh, on one side and exciting on the other side. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it, it's a very complex uh, question uh, in that the future is dubious, where with Chris running it, the future is not dubious. You know, it's solid. And uh, so... You know, it's, I don't know. 
and I think most people will say that today that running a public company, especially with the amount of regulation that's on top of, and, and it's going to become worse. Uh, you know, the amount of regulation, you know, um, that, that comes on public companies is just going to get tougher and tougher. Chris, does that make you want to stay away from going public when you hear your dad talk about it like that? Well, yeah, and that's kind of why it's, um, you know, well, A, we're, we're nowhere near that size or scale to, to do. Um, but I admire, you know, the public companies are wonderful, but really you look at the great companies are the ones that somehow just took their time. And I asked um, the CFO, who's a good friend of mine of, of, uh, of um, Panda Express, and I said, why, 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 you know, why are these young guys? And he said, nobody just has the patience anymore to build a company, a great company over a, a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants that right at the gate. And if you have a little bit longer horizon, um, you can, you know, you get over that hump and you don't need that public money. You got plenty of cash flow to grow. Um, you know, you look at Panda Express, it'll build 200 restaurants a year this year, mm -hmm. 200, and, you know, an Outback, I think at its, at its height, will build 150. Mm-hmm. 200 restaurants a year, it just takes a little bit longer to get there. But once you get there, um, the business has enough cash flow internally that you don't need that external cash flow. You just got to be patient to get to that moment. And that's yeah. what I think we are, and you know, a little younger. So, how long did it take Panda Express to get to that point? I mean, they're a 30 year old company now. Okay. So, you know, I mean, Outback's 32 years old. So, you know, one's doing, I think, I don't know. I think they're worth like, you know, 8 billion and one's worth 4 billion. Yeah. So. Tim, do you think you looking back, do you think you would not go public uh, if you could do it all over again and just take the time to build it the way kind of Panda expressed it? Um, yeah. I mean, I would have been happy, you know, to own like five or six or 10 Outbacks, you know, just my own and run them you know, how much joy in, you go in and you're the owner. Um, it, I don't know. The atmosphere of a public company is just so different. You know, the CEOs have such authority, you know, to, to make so many changes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you get a leader like Chris who listens to his staff and listens to his people. You know, uh, I, that's the problem that I see with public companies. They get a CEO in there that you know, from another industry, right? And they come into the restaurant industry and they think they know everything. You know, they think, oh, listen, this is what we're going to do and it's going to work. Yeah. They don't consult with people. They don't listen to other people. They just arbitrarily because they have that power. And that power is from a, a public company. CEOs are given so much power in a public company. It's where, you know, family-run businesses, you know, I could call, Chris, hey, Chris, you know, uh, have you thought about this? And I heard, you know, why don't you rethink this side and, and whatever. So he, he's got that, but if Bole was sold and there's another CEO that came in, you know, the guy means to say, Hey, Mr. Gannon, you're great, but I got this. And that's kind of what happens is they don't want to listen to founders because of the amount of power they have, you know, and they don't need to, it's, you know, and that's, you know, that's, what's kind of scary about, you know, going public and, um, and, you know, I mean, you know, but at the same time, you know, ringing the bell, having the liquidity, having unlimited gunpowder to grow your brand. And, you know, that's the, the thing about Bole is it's got, it's got a it's, a, it's a fabulous brand. And I think it should be in every city in America and it could well go international to Brazil, to Korea, to, I think this brand can work anywhere. Um, and so that, I don't think, I mean, you could probably do that with a strong, uh, family office group, you know, um, a very strong group that has, you know, hundred million to throw at it right away and get it up and running to that kind of thing. And there are, there are those around, uh, so there are all today, there's alternatives to going public. And I think, you know, finding a good financial partner. Um, right now, Bole's got a great bank and they're fabulous in the, you know, they treat us like partners. And it's, you know, uh, Chris is just in a great, such a great position. And I think 
we can continue to grow. And I, and I think growing too fast is a problem. Yeah. It's a real problem, you know, for people when they, they get arrogant, we're going to open here and open there and open in LA and open New York city. And they don't know the dynamics of, of making those kind of moves to see how expensive uh, and things change like in New York city now, you know, where everything has got closed up and, mm-hmm. and it's the taxes are crazy and California is going nuts. So, um, you know, it, it, so going slow and being methodical, you know, as a family business, I don't know, it's probably feels the right thing to do for me. How old is Bolay now, Chris? Five years. We're starting in 16, 2016. Okay. In two weeks, you'll have 19 stores in five years, which is pretty fascinating. That's a great, yeah. that's amazing growth, actually. Um, what's your growth plan for, just say, the next five years for Bolay? We kind of mapped it out, and, and um, you know, obviously, it's always good to have some goals. I think within, I want to say six years, because five years is difficult, but on year, six years from now, we should be, if, if we all goes to plan, at 100 locations. Mm-hmm. in five or six states um and i think that's that's doable um you know barring that you know we're going in two new states next year so that's really mm-hmm. going to stretch us a little bit and, and show what we're made out of um, but then when you're in those two states you have a wonderful launching platform to grow other states and uh, and you know we'll see you know i think it's um you know it's like a captain of a, of a boat you know he's always on the throttles and when that when the boat you know so everybody starts getting bounced around too much because the waves you pull back the throttles a little bit you know, yeah. and when it's smooth and flat, you put the throttles down. And I think that's kind of, you know, obviously our decisions have to be made in a 12 to 24 month forward thinking cycle because mm-hmm. of the ramp up and signing leases and getting your people and your systems and process in place. So it's a little difficult. Um, but, uh, but, uh, you know, the beauty of it too, is I also do have the blueprint, you know, I, I got to grow up around watching my father and how they did multi-unit area locations and, you know, food techs and uh, purchasing and, you know, procurement. And, and I will tell you, Chris, one of the, um, I told this to my, uh, the other day, the, one of the most beautiful things that we have, or I have, or Bole has going for us is that um, it was co-founded by my father, Tim Gannon and him and he and his partners did such a great job in the industry that their name is so positive and profound. So that way, when we do talk to landlords or we go talk to every vendor, as you know, it's a small world. Um, we're dealing with a lot of the same vendors, but now I'm dealing with their son. Mm-hmm. And so their, their father said, Hey, deal with Chris. I had a great relationship with Tim Gannon. We built a wonderful billion million dollar business relationship together. And so I get to ride on those coattails of, um, of good business ethics and and good business practices and a great name out there and so um like i said it's that alone has been an incredible asset for us talking to landlords recruiting new leaders whatever may be all of our vendor partners that we deal with um it's been it's been wonderful tim you started out with a i think you said a loan for the first outback of around three hundred thousand. i'm curious what what was the first amount you needed for the first belay chris so we probably spent two million dollars to build the first bowl okay. um and that's you know half of that is we had to put a letter of credit down it's just a different world you know we, yeah. we wanted a main and main site dad when he did his did it in a, uh, a corner site in the middle of uh, a neighborhood that wasn't supposed to do well in tampa south tampa we did bowl on main and main um where we weren't a name and i remember like it was yesterday the landlord said you know you know, we're vying for a couple other sites and trying to fight against, the, you know, the big name brands with these big corporate guarantees. And that's what these landlords want. They want these corporate guarantees. So we mm-hmm. had to tie a lot of our money up in a letter of credit. Um, and I remember the landlord said, well, Chris, what's the name of your concept? I said, I don't have that yet. Um, <laughs> it's, it's still a work in progress, but I promise you, and I looked him in the eyes, um, I promise you we won't fail. Um, we know what we're doing and we're going to, we're going to put in everything we have all in. My wife was pregnant with our first baby there mm-hmm. and we're hanging the pictures up at the wee hours of the night in the building. And just that, that perfect story. We, we have created some of the original recipes and we we started out doing juices and we, we did all those juices in my garage, learning mm-hmm. how to make a juice, you know, from the, with the machine spraying and in the ceiling, just all kinds of fun stories and using every marketing tactic I knew. 
breaking every little bending every little law we could to, to, from a marketing perspective, when we went and open, we had a line out the door the first day and, um, and never looked back. And then, you know, dad said, Hey, Chris, let's talk to this landlord. There's another site. And sure as heck in eight months, we had our second restaurant open. So everybody's like, Hey, what was your business plan? And, and the business plan was to, to not fail. Simple. <laughs> that was it. Like, don't, it's a great don't business fail. Plan. And, and, and we didn't. And it was just, it was that and, and open one great restaurant at a time. And we stayed yeah. true to that. And we still talk about it. Hey, well, how many restaurants do you want to open up? And to be honest with you, Chris, it's, it's the next one we're focusing on is open that one up perfectly. And then once we're done with that one, you open the next one up perfectly. And if you just keep doing that cadence, I think we'll, we'll be, uh, successful you talked about um learning great business ethics from your dad and this is something i think about quite often tim tim i'm curious um was there ever a time i'm sure there was could you tell us about a time that your your the boundaries of your business ethics may have been pushed uh and you had to push back to make sure that you could keep your your solid reputation as an entrepreneur and a businessman hmm Um, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think when it came to making decisions about the menu, uh, in doing the right thing, in upholding the standards of ingredients, we were pushed to having to lower food costs in order to preserve our margins. And, you know, and I'm sitting there looking, do I make this call? Do I make that call? Do I change from pure butter to this, you know, artificial whipped butter? All of those things, you know, you're looking right at and just saying, I know what I should do, but can I do it in this environment? Mm -hmm. And can we pull it off and still be true to ourselves? You know, those, those were, that was 08. 08 was very challenging for everybody. A very dark moment, you know, in the entire in the entire world, in the entire United States. Um, and we almost went bankrupt during that period of time. So, mm. uh, you know, we survived it, you know, and by staying true, true to, um, to all of the things, but, you know, I, so that was, that was my decision. I remember, you know, I remember there was another time, um, we had, you know, uh, you know, some, um, a bacteria that was out in some of the boxes of the steaks. Um, and I had to make a call to shut down a meat company, you know, right in the middle of their production and shut mm. the entire, you know, thing down because of this bacteria. And it was difficult because they were a great meat. I have been a great supplier to us, but I, you know, it's something that I was, if I didn't do it, I would risk, you know, the health of, uh, of our customers. And so, you know, those were very challenging uh, moments in my career that I had to, you know, do the right thing. It's very difficult because we really didn't have another meat company that could that could pick up the slack. So yeah. we had to do go back to one of our companies and just say, you're going to have to hire overtime. You're going to have to work three shifts. You're going to have to do this to get us through this. And it was very, very challenging because the easy thing would is just like, let a few people get sick. You don't know how many and let's fix, fix this bacteria at, you know, with time and kind of like overlook it. And we didn't, you know, we, we did the hard, hard deal, but it was, I, I remember those were really, really difficult, um, difficult times, um, you know, to shut down a meat plant and not know how you're going to keep up with supply. You know, you like, not sure what, what's ahead of us, but we know that we have to do this. There are a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, you know, and I think Outback was a great company. The ethics were really solid. We treated our people right, never lied to people. We, you know, we, we gave them a compensation plan that stayed true for so many years, you know, the, of equity partnerships and they put, wrote a check for 25,000 and they got, 10% of cash flow in an equity position in their restaurant. It was, you know, the, we, that's what really why we got entrepreneur of the year. So, um, you know, it was, you know, it was, I don't know, it was just an ethical company that Chris and Bob and just honest people, you know, and that's yeah. why I had dinner 
you know, Sunday night with, uh, with Chris, you know, we're still great friends today, you know, and Bob, you know, I'll see him tomorrow night. So we're, even though now we're competitors, you know, they have their restaurants and we compete, but we, you know, we have fun. I mean, the restaurant business, it's, it's, it's a sport. It's, you know, let's go and play, you know, it's, let's go play this game of, of restaurants and see who wins. Yeah. And if you look at it like that, then it's fun. And you don't take it so serious, you know, life and death and, and get all your ego in front of you. You got to play it like a game. And uh, there's some winners and losers and you always want to be a winner. Just like Monopoly, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. yeah. I mean, it, it lightens the load a little bit. You yeah. know, when you look at it like that, you don't have your ego so wrapped up, you know, in this. And you know, I remember when Norman Brinker was a friend of mine at Chili's and he copied the Bloomin' Onion, you know, I forget what they called theirs. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and I raised hell, I said, how can he steal our appetizer? You know, <laughs> and Chris Sullivan looked at him and he says, hey, it, this is the game we play. This is how we do it. And he's, He's making a strategic move on us, so let's 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 outplay him. So you know, and th that's when I learned that you know, you know, you gotta you can't get so deep in the in the trenches that you can't you know kind of come up and laugh a little bit about what this what this enterprise is. It's a you know, it's 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 a game people play. And there's winners and losers, and mm -hmm. you want to win, and you got to work hard though. To win you're always having to figure out the next move and that's you know chris that's what chris does what's my next move you know we talked you know this afternoon about you know when his you know uh the website with the uh, you know the um the app comes and and how we can do drive you know all the things we're we're trying to do as our next move to better the concept mm -hmm. and you have to do that you have to you know you can never be um content with today you have to be like whatever we do today we can do it better tomorrow yeah chris your dad uh complimented you earlier on the interview about the traits he admires about you what are some of the the traits um that he has that you really admire his incredible commitment to to quality and uh and, and to great flavors and great food and building great teams like i, I watched dad on and off the field and i remember vividly um going into his early meetings at outback and uh you know when he went to the food tastings and i and he didn't know but i was filming him i grabbed out my little phone there's like you know flip phones and i was filming him and i just because i was just like wow i knew dad is my dad but i watched him in his his setting when the whole team was just encapsulated by what he was going to say next and and it wasn't necessarily what he was going to say next, but it was the questions he asked the team. And it was the inspiration he gave to them. Cause I remember he would do that and he would be out and the whole team would go back there and they'd start doing all this stuff. And I'm like, man, he knows how to work that room really well. And so that was kind of cool to, to, to grow up watching that. And, um, and I remember that. And I remember, you know, you don't always tell people what to do, but you just give them the idea and you let that, you know, kind of start blossoming with inside their head and become their own idea. Um, and, and, you know, so I think it was just the desire to win him and I still play golf and tennis against each other. And they, we still get some good heated matches. And uh, mm -hmm. I know the teams may or may not always be stacked in someone's favor, but uh, his desire to win is still there. And it's, it's awesome. And, and it's inspiring. And, uh, you know, it, it all comes down to like, you know, it's a sport and you win, you win a sport by building winning teams. So, yeah. yeah. Chris, uh, I want to ask you as a um, professional athlete and successful entrepreneur, what are, what are a couple of your most important high performance tips that you would give the listeners? Hmm. Um, prepare, 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 practice, um, you know, you know, have the knowledge, use your gut. Don't get out there on the field if you're not ready. Um, I, I know there was a couple of times I got in business and I thought I was ready. You know, I hear so many of these young kids in college and they want to be entrepreneurs and this and that. And it's, and it's so cool. And I'm like, be careful. Don't just run and jump and go be an entrepreneur, go out there 
I mean, I worked in many different restaurants. I, you know, fine dining to fast food to casual dining. And then I also went and worked in marketing. And so I took all of those things and then I went and created Bolle with dad, but I didn't just go start a restaurant right out of college. Some people can do it. Mark Zuckerberg can do it. You know, there's some people that just have that innate boom, get lucky, knock it out of the park. But for me, it was build that, that, that knowledge base up. And, um, and that comes to preparation. You know, you can't go win the U S open in polo if you don't prepare the horses and yourself and the team to go win the next day. Um, and, 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 you know, always have your eye out for that next great horse or that next great restaurant leader, because that's how you're going to win. Nice. Tim, that same question to you as a successful polo player, champion, and entrepreneur, what are some of your most important high performance tips? You know, um, you know, a lot of people don't think this is really important or overlook it and they don't dive deep in it. But I think the most important thing a true leader can do is to understand um, your weakness. Uh, what is that? What is where are you weak? And a lot of people, oh, I'm not, I, I don't know what my weakness is. You know, they don't, they won't focus on it. And until you focus on what your weakness is, you can never build your team, your team around you that is so important. So, my, my and, and if you want to know what your weakness is, go ask your parents. You know, they usually know <laughs> what your weakness is. Uh -huh. So, Too my fault. mother, when I was, um, 17 years old and I was parking cars at the Mai Kai restaurant in Fort Lauderdale uh, till two o'clock in the morning on school nights, which I should not have been doing. Um, uh, and I, you know, I wanted to be a polo player parking cars, which is a big stretch from making a dollar 95 an hour back then it was minimum <laughs> wage. And, um, and my mother said, it's my job to tell you, what your Achilles heel is. I think everybody knows this great story of Achilles it was dipped into a river by his mother um, and she held him by his heels. And that's where your Achilles heel is. Mm -hmm. That was the place that was unprotected, um, you know, on Achilles. And, and, um, and, you know, in the movie with Brad Pitt, when he was finally, um, uh, an arrow went to his Achilles heel, it put him down. Mm -hmm. And because um, he was the only area he did not protect. And he didn't know that he really should have protected. Anyway, it's a fascinating story. My mother told me my Achilles heel was that I was optimistic to a fault. And you have to think about that for a minute. Uh, she was a very bright woman and she knew me well. But here I am trying to park cars, see student. And I want to play polo. Like Chris says, you're not going to get, you know, make your money first. Don't try and get to the polo field before you establish yourself as a successful person. Mm -hmm. And so what I, so here I am optimistic to a fault. Well, I want to build, I want, I wanted a restaurant in every city in the world. You know, at one point, you know, people said, well, God, did you ever, did you ever think you were going to have 1400 restaurants in 28 countries, 17 languages. I said, hell yes, I did. I wonder why we don't have more. You know, I was like shocked that, we, you know, we didn't continue to be an 8 billion, a 16 billion, a whatever, you know, kind of company is what I, what I, you know, was hoping for. And, but that's me. I was always optimistic to a fault. And the fault is that if you stay optimistic without knowing what your, you know, what your weak spot is, it's going to be a fault. It's going to be a problem. And so once you know that, you, I put myself and surrounded myself with Chris Sullivan, who's not optimistic to a fault. Bob Basham, they're realists. They're stone cold, hardcore. They wanted to open four Outbacks, mm -hmm. you know, in two years. That was their goal. And they wanted them to do $2 million a piece and make a quarter of a million dollars. Strong, 25 percent or, or uh, 12 percent per restaurant and 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 i'm like that's so boring but <laughs> it was with that conservative uh niche that i i went into that the wheel and mine was full of passion and, and let's do it and let's go for it 
and uh, push the wheel going. And it was their conservative that kept the wheel together, mm -hmm. that kept the wheel oiled, that, that worried about if we hit a bump that, you know, we're going to slow down. So I, I think you got to know your weakness. Uh, and once you do, and you really have to focus on it, say, okay, it's not bad to have a weakness because once you understand what your weakness is, believe it or not, it then becomes your strength. Mm -hmm. You're going to turn your, you know, headwind into a tailwind because you've identified what your weakness is and you're surrounding people that are never going to let that weakness get exposed. So that's my, that's my two cents on, on how to know yourself, uh, how to increase in being prepared. Then, you know, once you know your weakness, then you can prepare your team around that weakness and prepare and Chris is right. You know, you, you know, to open a restaurant and you're not ready to open a restaurant with your trainers, your permits, everything ready to go. You know, you're fired up, you've done some pre-marketing and you're ready to go. It shows in an open. Yeah. And it's like, you know, okay, we don't have enough people. Okay. The, you know, gas isn't working. Okay. The restaurants, air conditioning's not right. We're, you know, all those problems that do happen, you know, from time to time, but the checklist gets longer on the next restaurant. We cover that. So I think preparation and knowing your weakness are the two strongest points of being a winner. Good point. Good point. Okay, Chris and Tim, I think I'm going to wrap the call up there. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show and sharing all your tips and tricks and wisdom with us. Chris, I wish you the most success with Bole. Tim, I wish you the most success with uh, watching Chris grow and advising him along the way. And uh, thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate thank you. having you on the Thanks, show. Thanks, Chris. It's been, it's been very enjoyable. Thank you, Chris. That was a great, great show. Listeners, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody.